That is true, I do have the world's cutest baby. Um, and I just wanted to say, it's a, it really is great to speak at XWorld again. I was here a couple of years ago as a, um, an audience member uh, and had such a fantastic time. And the last two years I've been able to speak as well. So uh, thank you to Tony and thank you to David um, and all the organizers. It's just, it's a really great um, event, I think, and I'm one of the highlights of the Mac calendar. Um, and please make sure you go to the dinner tonight because uh, you'll hear some things on stage and they'll be really interesting hopefully, uh, but then you'll hear much better behind the scenes stories. The, it'll be like the director's commentary if you pour a couple of beers into some of the speakers and, and find out what actually went down uh, in some of their presentations. So last year, the talk I did was kind of on, well, it was on customer service. And this year I'm doing the same, just because that's kind of all I know. Um, I have been a sysadmin in the past and I found it, it, it just bored me to death. Um, Servers, I don't really like talking to servers. They're not that interesting. Um, and I have played with code and I've written some scripts and things, but it's just not my thing. I'm glad that we have people like Cameron, who is one of the guys I work with. He's just sitting down here. I'm glad I have people like him to do that stuff for me because, or, you know, do that stuff alongside me, I should say. He's definitely my boss. I shouldn't <laughs> speak about him like that. Um, but I really love technology. And that's kind of how I fell into this gig. Um, I really love technology and I really love helping people to use the technology that they have to use every day better. So that's kind of what mo motivates me. And um, last year, the central theme uh, to my talk was to listen to your customers, but also to talk to your customers more. Um, and I think we're really lucky. For, for most people who work in a university here, I'd say that's the majority of the people in the room, we're actually really, really lucky. I've had a lot of gigs in support over the years, and uh, working in a university is really, really great for me just because they're, our customers are so smart. Like, they're actually really interesting people to talk to. I really love chatting with them. Um, and because they're quite smart, they, they, you, know, you can kind of trust them a little bit more than I think sometimes we do trust them. Uh, so that's kind of been my ongoing theme for the last couple of years of working at a university as well, is like, listen to your customers, listen to how interesting they are, they are and you know, like they, they probably have a better idea in some, some respects of what we kind of always think is, you know, as IT guys, we kind of think we know exactly how a system should be because that's how a system always has been. Sometimes just chatting to, to our customers, we can actually find out we could try something new. So that was the message of last year. Listen to your customers and talk to your customers. As you see, as you may see in this uh, presentation, it's not always as easy as that. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But before we do, so the name of the talk was uh, uh, Mac Support and the Serenity Prayer, which is, I must admit, you know, completely pretentious. Um, it was one of those things I just kind of wrote so that I would have a placeholder for my title. Um, it's not really about the serenity prayer, but I think it's worthwhile. Can you actually read that? Yeah, you can read that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more about just change in general, that change is constant in IT, especially in the Mac space. And I don't know, I just, I, because change is so central, I always kind of think of this. And you, you might have heard this, you've probably heard this on TV or movies when, you know, someone, when a character goes to an AA meeting, this is what they say at the start of an AA meeting. So, uh, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the dis di difference. Sorry. Now, I'm definitely not a religious man, but I have been pondering this prayer more and more this year in regards to Mac support. Because in a Windows world, and in an enterprise world, there are certain things that are just out of our control. Certain things I'd love to change, but I can't. Um, even working with Apple, uh, Apple don't consult me before they update OS X. Uh, they don't make changes based on what will work best in our environment. Uh, and they certainly don't give us any warning. They just do what they want to do, whatever works for their company. And that's fair enough. It's turned out pretty well for them. So, you know, you kind of have to be comfortable with change when you're working in this environment. You have to be prepared to move quickly with Apple. And I personally love change. I, I find it really fascinating. I'm, I'm swapping phones every other day. Um, you know, I'm running the betas on all my hardware, which is possibly why the, uh, the connection didn't work just then. Um, so I'm, I'm always you know, up for change. But I've realized, uh, as I've worked in IT, that um, I'm kind of not the norm. People seem to really hate change. 
<laughs> People hate change a lot. Yeah. So, but we can't really stop change. It, it's going to happen no matter what. So, and that makes uh, Mac Enterprise support quite difficult because, like I said, Apple are constantly changing. In the time I've been at UNSW, it's, it's only been four years, feels like about 15. Um, We've gone through six variations of OS X. Of course, there's another one just around the corner. Uh, in that same time, we've had one version of Windows. Uh, Windows 7 has been kicking on since I've been there. Um, and so, yeah, the Windows side of things, it's a very easy, well, it's not easy in any way, but it, it's at, at least easy to kind of get your head around. They can clearly say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lock this down. It doesn't change all that much. We don't get that opportunity, as I think the, the Jamp boys kind of talked about just a moment ago. The Apple landscape is always changing. We don't have that stability. I've just said that. Um, and of course, like I said as well, Apple really never give us much feedback on what they're going to do next. We can show up to WWDC. We can kind of you know, hear whispers. But there's not a lot of kind of forward planning that you get from Apple unless you kind of like read the tea leaves of what they what they're doing and kind of like, you know, it's, it's like you can plot them on a graph and see, well, this is kind of where they're going. So I can probably try to aim for this. Um, I could probably try to make our system as close to retail as possible. And that's been kind of one of our themes at, at UNSW for the last couple of years as well. So up until last year, um, we'd been using a bit of software called Absolute Manage. And it's actually really, really good. Um, does anyone in the room use it? One? One person. OK, yep. Uh, well, yeah, we felt like the only people using it um, <laughs> when we would come to events like this. Um, and like I said, honestly, it really is quite good software. Um, but it's just, it, as, as software, it really kind of struggled to keep up with Apple's breakneck speed of the last couple of years. Um, there were a couple of major things that Apple did that, um, that Absolute Manage weren't supporting. They don't have any support for DEP, for instance. Um, and they, it was just becoming kind of obvious to us that we might need to look at other things. So about two years ago, we started looking at other alternatives. And the two big ones, as you guys would know, are Monkey, um, the open source project, and uh, Casper. Um, do we have Monkey users in the room? OK, cool. Well, we looked at Monkey. I'll start there. We looked at Monkey, and you know, there's a lot to like about it. Um, it's an open source product. It's created by Google. Well, it was originally created by Google to manage their fleet. Um, it has become an open source product since then. It is really, really powerful. But I think it kind of feels like an open source product in many ways. You know, it's constantly changing. Um, it's, it's a little bit rough around the, the edges. And it feels like the kind of software that was clearly developed by a, an organization like Google where everyone has a computer science degree. You know, where everyone is probably a doctor in computer science. And so it's not really as user friendly as we, we would need in our environment. So we looked at it. It was kind of cool. But then we took a look at Casper as well. And I don't want to turn this into a Casper uh, commercial, although the Casper boys are nodding saying I can. Um, but yeah, we looked at it and we thought, look, there's a lot to like about Casper. It was a clear market leader. It was stable. It was pretty nice to look at. Had a you know a really interesting UI, um, a really vibrant community. That was one of the big things that I, I found when I was uh, you know doing searches. You, you mentioned that a lot of uh, Casper users, oh sorry, Jamf Nation users aren't Casper users. Well, that was us a couple of years ago. When I, whenever I was doing searches for for things, I would constantly find the answers I needed on the Jamf Nation forums. So that that was one of the big things as well that we looked at. Uh, it was cloud hosted. Um, which is a big thing at UNSW because we're all about the cloud. Um, it had local support, which was fantastic. That was one thing that our, um, our previous vendor didn't really have. Uh, so there was a lot of kind of delays in uh, getting anything sorted between our previous uh, users, uh, our previous vendor, sorry. And the thing we liked the most uh, was it was customer empowering, as in it was able to provide a self-service um, option for users to set up. Now, actually, how, I should have asked, how many people are using Casper? Yeah, so you all know this. We were late to the party, OK? 
But, so last year, August, we found out um, that Absolute Manage was not going to be able to uh, support uh, El Capitan when it was released. Um, they gave us a timeline, a rough timeline, that they probably wouldn't be able to support it till about Q2 2016, which by that stage El Capitan had been announced at DubDub but hadn't shipped yet. So we knew there, well, if we wanted our labs to work at the start of next semester, at, at the start of this year, um, we needed to move somewhere. And like I said, we knew LCAP was coming out. And we knew with that, there would probably be new hardware. And of course, with Apple, they never give you a break. So whenever there's new hardware, it has to support the latest versions of the software that gets released. So um, on September 30, LCAP came out with it. A 1080p, a 4K, and a 5K iMac. All of those, all three models, would not support anything but El Capitan. So if any staff members started purchasing those, we wouldn't be able to support them on our current system. So yeah, that was the crunch time. Uh, our little Mac team knew that we had to move uh, to another program, uh, another vendor. And like I said, we had been looking at both. So we were pretty confident that we were able to move. And this was, this was probably late August, uh, sorry, early August. Um, then another thing happened that kind of got in the way a little bit of our plans. Um, so that little guy on the end there is uh, Eden, and that's the world's cutest baby, that's Penny. Um, they both came around in mid-August as well, uh, which was, <laughs> it wasn't a surprise. I mean, we knew we, we knew we were expecting kids, but it was just one of those things where it was like, well, okay, so we've got six weeks of, um, paternity leave each to kind of get past, and then we'll start on this new program of getting people ready, putting together our comms, putting together our kind of change orders, everything else, and moving towards Casper. Because we knew that we had that September 1, we, we, sorry, semester 1 hard deadline. That was the deadline that we thought was the major deadline we had to meet. Um, in terms of the other, the, the new models, we could probably get by on thin imaging and things like that, so it wasn't that much of a concern, but we definitely had to have the labs ready by the start of this semester. But Cameron, down here, being Cameron, um, he enjoys the challenge. So while we were away on paternity leave, Cameron spun up a server and got it working and got uh, a whole bunch of pilot machines working as well. And so by the time uh, September 30 came around, and we were back on board, and Apple had just released El Capitan and those new Macs. Uh, Cameron actually had um, a full system ready to go to support uh, El Capitan and those new Macs bang on that day. It was pretty amazing. And you'd think that was a win, right? Well, see, UNSW is a very large organization, and the thing about large organizations is um, we have many, many customers across many faculties. We have faculty managers, we have change managers, we have manager managers, we have like hundreds of people that need to know exactly what is happening all the time. And that's totally fair, like that is their job and they've got customers and they've got customers' customers and they've got managers. So everyone needs to kind of be in the loop. And what happened there was because people slowly started to hear leaking out that there was this whole new way of supporting the Macs, but they didn't really know exactly what was going on, people started freaking out. People really, really freaked out that we were moving to a whole new system, that it was gonna cut them out of the support somehow. Uh, it was just, you know, uh, nature kind of abhors a vacuum, and when there's a vacuum of information, rumors just fill the space. So that's kind of what was happening. People really, really freaked out. And even our support staff actually got a little bit miffed. Not everyone, but some, some people in our support staff, I think, felt that because Casper was such a fundamental shift in how our current system worked, uh, they kind of didn't want to move. You know, they knew absolute manage. They knew how to send software to a machine when someone called up and asked for it. They knew how to do any of that kind of stuff, re-image a machine, whatever. Um, and so this whole new system seemed like a completely different thing. And again, that idea of, and now it's self-service, a lot of our support staff thought, oh, right, great, so now you don't need me anymore. The customer will do all of the work. And of course, that is not the case, like, especially in this uh, transition period. We need our support staff more than ever. 
But um, people just kind of freaked out a little bit. Uh, so, you know, we knew that Casper was the right thing to do. We were just really, really bad at telling all the people we needed to tell about it. And really, when it comes to support staff, you have to get them on board because they're the ones talking to your customers. So if they're kind of annoyed or they think something's stupid, even if they don't say it outright, they're definitely going to let their customers know. So, because remember, people really hate change. This uh, headline was written about a unannounced removal of the headphone jack, and it, it just went nuts. Um, and to be honest, I really do think Apple are going to get rid of the headphone jack on this particular case, just because I don't, I don't have any like, technical reason to say that. Um, I don't care what their eventual uh, reason they say publicly will be. But I just kind of think that the fact that they have announced this, well, they have leaked this information so early on so that everyone can get really angry and then accept it. Mm -hmm. And then people like Cameron, what, last week you bought a pair of Bluetooth headphones reluctantly? I think that is kind of like they know exactly what they're doing. So maybe, maybe the case is when you've got really, really bad information, leak it as far <laughs> as possible, and then people can accept it over that period of time. But for the majority of times, just you know, let your customers know what's going on. But I'm sure that, yeah, the iPhone 7, for all the people who have written articles like that, come the launch, they're going to be outside the Apple store with the rest of us. So I think this is working out for Apple. I think they're going to be all right. So last year, I showed this slide. And I said, sometimes it's hard to see the customers uh, through the SLAs. Um, and this time, year, I'm going to say the same. Well, I'm, I'm going to use the same image and say, sometimes it's hard to see our customers through our own great ideas. Because we knew move, moving to Casper was a great idea. We had oodles of reasons why it would improve our customers' lives. Like I said, we just forgot to tell them. And when we moved too quickly, we didn't take them with us, and they freaked the hell out. So how did it all turn out? Well, the first thing we had to do was accept the fact that we might have messed up. And we kind of went on a, a PR campaign. Uh, we got a fantastic BRM that works with us to go out to meet all the faculty members, uh, faculty managers, stakeholders, and explain what was happening and why it needed to happen. It wasn't something we were just doing for the hell of it. This was something that we needed to do to be able to continue to support our users. Uh, the key here was kind of admitting our mistake um, and taking that hit. It was a bit of a bummer because it actually slowed down the rollout. Like We were ready to go on day one, but we had to kind of wait until this PR campaign had finished. Um, I'm sure your universities aren't like this and everything just moves you know, very smoothly, but our university sometimes has these moments. Um, we created docs, we updated the website, we explained exactly what was happening. We organized training sessions with all of our staff, so training sessions with the faculty members as well as training sessions with our customer support team to explain to them what was happening. Um, and then we also had just like really casual meetings as well, big meetings, uh, just to explain what was going on with pizza and people could just, you know, it, it was still kind of a work in progress ourselves. So we were just moving as quickly as we could to get this new system up. So there were still a whole bunch of questions and, and ways to do things that we hadn't really gotten worked out ourselves. So to have people in the room was really great to just kind of bounce ideas off. As for Casper itself, we really dig it. Um, its, its interface is incredibly intuitive for end users, so that's good. Um, the web panel, Cameron has some issues with. I'm sure he uh, has explained them over beers last night. Um, but you know, our customers don't see that, so that's fine. Um, I've personally managed to migrate a whole bunch of users uh, myself, and I do feel that there is probably one of the things our customer support staff were saying was, it's going to take so much time to explain how everything works, and it's such a pain. Uh, I actually did, I timed it. Um, and yeah, I did spend a little bit more time with the customer explaining our new system and how it all worked. But that time that I spent explaining was more than made up by the fact that I didn't have to pre-stage a machine and stick it in AD and reinstall the software and, and do everything else that we had been doing up until that point. So basically, we had shifted from about two hours prep and drop off the machine to the user to about half an hour with the user. And that's much better for the user. Because then we can actually explain to them what's going on. You know, I used to work in uh, hospitality, and we would 
always go over, like one of the rules we had in one of the restaurants I worked at was just always have a jug of water in your hand. So you can just always walk up to a table and just, even if they're, they're not asking, just refill the water and see how they're going. And just check the mood of the table. Just make sure that everyone is feeling okay in the restaurant. And I kind of feel that you know, those moments where we get to sit with a customer and just explain a new system is a really good time to kind of feel how our customers are feeling about the different changes that we're coming through. Some of the benefits, as I explained, um, Casper does, support, as, does support DEP. So we're now doing that, which is fantastic. Um, I'm sure you'll see this slide another time before this day is out. But um, the out-of-the-box nature does make rollouts um, a little bit faster, um, which is really, really good for us as well. And it also reduces the amount of kind of, uh, because we can roll out machines so much faster, it reduces the amount of space we need to actually have dedicated to storing machines as well. Like I said, we're a massive organization. So the ability to not have to have um, you know, 30 IMAX sitting in a room is pretty good. Uh, Casper does benefit uh, our laptop users as well, who um, consistently buy small hard drives even when no, we tell them not to. Um, they no longer have to deal with this gigantic monolithic image that we're pushing down to them. They, they just pick uh, the Adobe apps that they want and the Word apps that they want or the Office apps that they want. They don't need to grab the entire suite. They can also do their own patches for vulnerable software, which is cool. And this was the, I showed this last year as well, this was our most hated screen in the university, at least on the Mac side of things. This was the screen that people would see when our previous uh, vendor, Absolute Manage, was pushing software to their machine. So uh, you get customers who would come in and they might not have been, you know, they might have been on leave for three months and they'd plug in their computer and they had a presentation that afternoon and their computer went, oh wow, you've got nine months worth of updates to do and, and they had this screen stopping them from logging in. Uh, for the next couple of hours. So getting rid of that screen alone um, really, really helped uh, the way our customers see uh, our, our, our offering, basically. And of course, keychain. <laughs> the keychain is still a pain in, the, in many places. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and the fact that we're now allowing users to log in with uh, whatever kind of credentials that they want and then connect to our services once they're in um, really has eliminated some of those keychain issues as well, which is great. And the other nice thing was, once we actually got it into the hands of customers, once we had gotten past this whole kind of PR issue that we had had, it turns out customers really, really dug it. Like they immediately understood the, the benefits that, that we were providing. The fact that they could update their own software, that they were real proper admins of their machine. They got it, they understood it. It was uh, a really, really successful rollout. Now, of course, that does mean we currently have a mixed environment, which is um, a pain to support. But our support staff have been fantastic, so that's awesome. Um, and we do have, uh, it has given us a lot of work to do this year. Uh, we, are, we are coping. <laughs> we do have 924 Macs currently in Casper now. Um, we've got another. Uh, 600 or so max that we need to get across um, from our old system. Now, we would love to wipe them away and, and give them the full Casper self-service uh, experience, but uh, time is not really permitting on that one, so we're probably going to just have to move them across um, and, and keep them in a, in a kind of managed environment. Um, but we can do that too, so that's okay. Um, you know, that will make it even more complex for our customer service people to understand what might be on the other end of the phone when they're talking to someone. But again, I think we've, we've been lucky enough to have some really, really great customer service people in our team who can actually deal with that, and they've been fine with it. And, you know, Apple just doesn't slow down for a second. So, you know, we... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Apple announced their new, their new operating system. It hasn't shipped yet, but I did throw it on one machine. And of course, Casper just works with it because it's a really light touch. It doesn't really do much. It just kind of enrolls. So it, it's fine. It's already working. So that was another thing that um, we think has, for any pain that we're going through this year in terms of this change, it's going to be more than made up for the fact that we will be ready day one when Apple is ready. Um, and that's something that we always found. Kind of every year when our previous vendor wasn't ready on day one, 
all our little fanboys, and God bless them, but all our fanboys that we supported would immediately kind of upgrade their machines and break everything. So we don't have to worry about that so much anymore. And once we explained to our customers all those needs for change, all the reasons we did that, um, they got it, they understood. We just, we weren't moving to a new system because Jamie and Justin from Jamf uh, had a slick sales deck, although they do. Um, we weren't changing the whole system just for the hell of it. Uh, this was something that we needed to do. We would not have been able to continue to de deliver the service offering to our customers and what our customers expected and demanded from us um, if we hadn't moved when we did. We might have been a little enthusiastic in how fast we moved, but you know, it all worked out in the end. We just need to explain things better and earlier. So overall, in that particular case, we may not have done a very good job um, communicating with our customers at all times, but I think we made up for it uh, this year. So this year, we had another crisis uh, in the Mac space. And I won't go through the boring details, but basically, uh, so all of our lab machines, we moved our, um, our staff machines. Oh, that's supposed to be doing stuff. Uh, we moved our staff machines a couple of years ago to uh, local homes with crash plan backing them up. Um, but we'd kept the uh, lab machines still using network homes to log in, just because we thought, you know, uh, students need to be able to kind of have their, their work move from them, uh, with them, sorry, from machine to machine. Now, clearly, we'd moved the staff machines for a reason. The, the performance was just getting worse and worse on network accounts we per personally found in our network. Um, and it was just something that clearly Apple weren't throwing a lot of resources into either. Uh, they seem to be far more focused on the one-to-one -one than the enterprise. Um, and so, yeah, it just made sense for the staff machines to move across. But we hadn't done that, like I said, because we wanted to continue to give that lab-style environment where everything moves with you. So we had this slowdown. So we had to look at what had changed in 2016. Well. The operating system, we had moved all the labs to LCAP. Uh, the way the system was mounting the home drives had changed. We had to move that to SMB. Um, but that didn't really necessarily explain what we were seeing in terms of, sorry, that's a wall of text. This is from the, the actual presentation I gave to faculty members. Uh, that didn't really explain kind of some of the slowdowns we were seeing. Um, so we really had to kind of, we had no other choice but to really try to test it ourselves. And basically, the, the labs got to a really bad point just before the mid-semester break, which was handy. Uh, so we had that one week, the one week of the mid-semester break, to really try to break the system as it was happening and see what was going on. Now, we, we went through the, uh, the logs that we could see on the computer. And what was kind of happening was it basically looked like a DDoS attack. Um, it looked like certain Macs throughout the university if they got hung on logout, or their keychain was buggered, or some other thing like that, that one machine would just start hammering the, the file servers and just sending like thousands of broken requests a second. Um, and that was something that we, we would see across various labs. And so we were just staring at like sheets like this for, for a week. We had, a, we had meetings every morning where we'd go over the reports from the night before, try to identify what was actually going on, whether it was a you know specific rogue Mac, whether it was a Specific, specific, sorry, app that was being used. And there wasn't really a pattern. And we had, of course, tested the hell out of our lab machines before we moved them into production anyway. And we hadn't really seen any of these issues in our testing environment. So, like I said, we had one week. We had semester one break uh, to uh, try to break the machines as best we could. And so that's what we did. We spent a week um, hammering the machines. We, we set up like 100 fake accounts um, or throwaway accounts. And we'd log them in um, to all the Macs that we could at, at various times. And some would be you know, encoding video, and some had 15 apps open, and, and some had broken keychains, and some were stuck on logout. And we were doing as much as we could to kind of replicate what happens when 600 students use the labs at the same time. But without those 600 students, we could never really get this same slowdown. Like, we were having issues, but we were never seeing the same, like, deathly slow lab experience that our, our customers were seeing. And, and I've got to say, like, the labs were pretty much unusable. Uh, on, the, on the worst day that we had, 
the labs were so slow on network homes that it was pretty much unusable. So what I found really interesting about this whole week, though, was you know, as much as we went through, we, did, we got all CSI and went through all of the, you know, the code and everything, and everyone got really excited about all the cool nerdy stuff we were doing. Um, our manager at the time said, at the start of the week, I'll let you guys have a week to play as much as you can and try to break this as much as you can and try to replicate what we're seeing as much as you can. But you have to have a plan B um, because I don't want those labs to be um, as unusable when the students come back next week. So no matter what else, have a plan B ready to go uh, because you know, saying that, well, we think it's this is not good enough. There has to be a working lab next week. And that was a really interesting change for us. I mean, I, I, I can't really re recall, at least in my area, um, kind of given, given that, that option to, to try to come up with something completely new if what we had couldn't be fixed. So we did. We came up with a plan B if we couldn't get anything to work. And of course, we, we tried our best. We could not replicate 600 students um, we could not work out exactly what was going on. Buy me a beer tonight and I, I will give you all the theories that I have, but I probably can't say them here right now. Anyway, so instead we came up with an idea of hybrid homes. So it was going to be basically when you logged into a machine as a student or a, or a lecturer, um, you'd get a local home, but uh, your desktop and documents would still sync back um, to the servers. And I really should update that slide. I've been using that for years. I don't think you can get those servers anymore. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Oh, yeah, and it's like 10.8. Is that 10.8's desktop? Anyway. Um, yeah, so we realized, uh, so, so that, was, that was the idea, that we would have um, everything be local except the desktop and documents, which would be redirected back to the server to give users that same experience that they'd been used to up until that moment when, when they logged into a machine, their work followed them. Most users, we looked at how users used their computers and most users either saved on the desktop because that's where everyone does or de documents because that's what, what software does. Um, and so it looked like that was going to be the, big, the, the best improvement. And of course, the library was where most of the issues were coming from. And when we look through those logs, like I said, keychain, whenever, it's, whenever you have an issue with the Mac, it's generally the keychain <laughs> these days. Anyway, um, or Adobe. Uh, it's either get the keychain or Adobe. <laughs> um, and so we saw these kind of, that's, that's where all the logs were coming from. We thought, OK, well, if at least the worst actor here, the library folder, was local, that's probably going to be what, what we can do to uh, make those labs work again. Um, but that's where it got really interesting, because we had a meeting to explain this um, to the faculty managers, because the way it works at UNSW is the faculties themselves um, are responsible for the labs for their area. Um, we just provide the software and the, and the hardware. Well, they, it's, it's a very complicated system. Anyway, um, but they are in charge of their own labs. So we had to go down and, and have a meeting with the two biggest uh, faculties that we had that were being most affected by this, the ones that had the most amount of Mac labs. And we explained to them exactly what was happening. We explained that we worked our best to, to try to replicate what was going on, and we couldn't. And then we explained our new hybrid home system and said, said to them, this is what we think is probably the best uh, balance of safety for user data and performance. And what was really great there was uh, one of the faculty, uh, faculty managers actually said, hang on, let's have, like, I've, I've heard your, your thoughts. Let's have another meeting tomorrow with a whole bunch of students and lecturers. And why I think that's really interesting is that as a university, as a large organization, as any large organization, we're very risk averse. Um, what we were suggesting, like I said, was a really kind of uh, conservative way of approaching this issue. It was a big change for sure, um, but it was still a very kind of, it was the, the safest option we could do at that point. But having students and, and lecturers in the room as part of the meeting 
was really fantastic because we got to hear from them exactly, exactly how they were currently using their computers and what they expected from their lab machines. And when we said to them, like, w the reason we're su suggesting this uh, hybrid home is so that your files can follow you everywhere, they, they were just so confused. They were like, what are you talking about? Like, we use Dropbox, we use OneDrive, we use Google Drive. You know, for them, they didn't care that their, their folders oh, or their, their work followed them from lab machine to lab machine because it didn't follow them from lab machine to home, and that's all they cared about. You know, so they were already using cloud services to, to kind of bridge that gap. So all of these kind of uh, these, you know, strange hybrid uh, home systems that we were creating, they had already kind of gotten past it. So that's another time where I just kind of think, don't underestimate, don't underestimate your users, and don't un underestimate the value of speaking directly to them or approaching them with an idea that may not be fully baked yet and getting their feedback. You know, our, our customers, our biggest customers, are the students, and they're digital natives. They, they know this stuff already. Um, they just want their, the, the Macs in the labs to be as fast as the Mac they have at home. You know, we've spent the last four years at our organization moving to the cloud. They moved to the cloud four years ago. Like, it's something that they've already done. Um, and that's just the difference between enterprise and end users. And that's something that Apple have known for years, which is why Apple focus on the end user and not on the enterprise. Now, I've spent my adult life refusing to use a PC at work, um, even when I've been told I have to. And why? It's like, because I don't like it. Um, it just doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't have all the shortcuts I know. You know what, my real dad? So, like, <laughs> it would be really hypocritical of me to say to a customer, hey, you can't do this system because that's not the way IT does it. Um, so that's kind of why I, I, I have this, you know, belief that I have to kind of fight for the customer sometimes. Um, and I know I'm annoying, I'm sure I'm incredibly annoying to work with at times, but you know, there are enough people out there in most large organizations who are fighting the other way, fighting to lock everything down, fighting to keep everything as standard as possible. So I think it kind of, you know, it makes sense to at least have one annoying guy like me on every team. And um, if you don't have an annoying guy on your team, maybe be that guy. So anyway, so we found out that afternoon that we had a new plan. We had plan C now, and that was going to be local homes completely, just complete local homes with a bit of an education um, uh, program around it to explain what had changed so that no one lost their stuff. Um, our, our manager in the meeting at the time said, well, we can do this tonight, and then also turned to me and said, and can you make a video explaining the changes also tonight, uh, which was fun. That was a good challenge. Um, so Cam, he reconfigured the labs overnight and we started this kind of a uh, campaign. So this was the first thing we did really quickly, just we cre created a new uh, wallpaper for all the labs, so that the next morning when users logged in, they would get this nice little message, this friendly little message. And um, of course the arrow was pointing to where the server would sit on the, uh, on the desktop. So that was nice. Um, once Penny, the world's cutest baby, um, went to sleep, uh, then I did Get to work on the video. This was about 11 o'clock, so there's, there's two really embarrassing edits in this video, so don't judge me on it, but it, like I said, it was 11 o'clock. Until yesterday, when you used a Mac at UNSW, your home folder lived on a server, and all that data was streamed down to the Mac. In the last few weeks, those Macs and servers haven't been working well together, so we've needed to make a change. So now, we're keeping your stuff on the server and giving you a home that lives on your Mac. All the files that were on your desktop yesterday are now in a desktop folder inside the student server. Just look for your ZID folder. The big difference here is now your files and preferences will not follow you from Mac to Mac and classroom to classroom. You'll need to remember to save your work to the server or a cloud service like OneNote, Google Drive or Dropbox. You can also save your work to a USB drive, just remember to take it with you and make regular backups of the drive. USB drives are easy to lose. You're responsible for your data, so save early and save often. Thanks for watching and enjoy the faster, more reliable Mac Labs at UNSW. Cool. And so that video was also sitting on the desktop. And as part of the 
Um, the, the video was also emailed to every single student in those two faculties, to every lecturer in those two faculties. There was comms put out for everything. There was a whole, whole bunch of uh, crazy amount of work that happened in about six hours to get that working so that the labs would be ready for the first day back after the semester break. And just to add that, we also had a bunch of support staff that we uh, positioned in every single lab in, uh, in those two faculties uh, to be ready on the morning to explain any of the changes and uh, deal with any customers who had lost files. And um, there was nothing. Like, no one cared. It was, we, we put so much effort into this, we were freaking out so much that students wouldn't be able to get their head around it. And of course they did. Like, they, like I said, they had already been using Dropbox, they were already using OneDrive. Our university gives all students like one terabyte of OneDrive, so they, they're fine. They're okay with it. Um, so what we thought was going to be this gigantic kind of crisis, it was no one cared at all. So. But they were very, very happy that the labs were working. That was nice. Um, and that was really, really lovely as well, to walk around the, uh, I went up to one of the uh, student offices that is on the level three of one of the buildings that was most affected. And I came to them in, in the afternoon and just said, say, how's everything going? And the guy who sits behind the desk was like, everyone's nice today. <laughs> so I think we did well. But like I said, bringing in our students and our staff into the meeting we were able to come up with a fix that was far more radical than what we probably would have suggested by ourselves. Um, and, something, and once that they had taken ownership of it and said, no, this is the way we wanted to go, then it was much easier to then sell to the people above us who were also very nervous about any change going through. So I think it was just a really fantastic um, way to get the students involved to, get, to hear from them exactly what they wanted to have. And, Again, I'm not saying you, know, you can let everyone just run wild on your machine. You know, give someone an inch and they'll download Game of Thrones. But um, for the most part, I think you know, with just a small couple of like, boundaries in place, that's kind of all you really need. And now we have Macs in our labs performing as good as the Macs that our students use when they're at home. And that's all we really wanted. So we considered that one a win. Um, since then, we've been trying our absolute best to keep our users informed. Uh, like everyone else in tech these days, we do have a Slack channel um, so that people can uh, chat to us about any kind of issues that they see popping up. We have regular workshops with our key customers, our local support staff, um, and we're doing what we can to keep everyone involved. Uh, we currently have users testing our semester two labs. Um, a couple of different users around the, the campus testing our semester two lab, and when they log in, uh, that's the desktop they get. Just a little quick thank you from UNSW for testing our labs. We know it's a bit of a pain. So, you know, these are the little, it's a silly thing, but it's a, it, these are the little things we're trying to do to just, again, acknowledge our customers as often as we can. Because change is always going to happen, especially in this organization, especially in this kind of field that we're in. Uh, so the best that we can do is actually just bring our customers along with us explain to our, our customers exactly what is happening as soon as we know it, and kind of move through with them and get their advice and their, uh, their thoughts on any of the processes. Change is not that scary when you let people in into the conversation. And so that's what we're trying to do. Thank you.